Hello everyone. And uh, I am here to meet with my friend, my colleague, uh, Yamidi. We wanted to discuss a um, very important topic and she's really fresh. She's already here waving to me instead of joining. Um, hi, Yamidi. Let me invite her. Oh, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hi, so happy to see you. Same, how are you? Good, good, how are you? Thank you so much for joining. Thank um, you for having me. Yes, so we did talk uh, a few days ago and uh, we discussed um, an interesting topic and uh, every time I, I speak to you I wish I wish we could record it because uh, we never talk about like our normal people stuff we always bring uh, up some uh, important deep topics so and last time we were talking about body and um, health connection so we are both um, health professionals we both yeah. have a lot of experience. We're both in the dietetics. I don't know about you, Yamidi, but um, I do believe in nutrition a lot. However, after working with people for several years, after seeing many people and uh, a, a, like a long-term stories, I started to come up to that there's way more about our health than just physical activity or just healthy eating. And sometimes, very, very often, I started to even tell people, no, I'm not going to see you. You have to uh, see um, um, a different professional. You have to work on your stress management first because in your case, it's not a nutrition. I actually did the homework and went on your website. I wasn't sure how to start our conversation. <laughs> and uh, No, but you know what? Immediately, I saw a very important thought. Well... Well, first of all, uh, some some of my friends may not know you. Not only you're my friend, not only you're a registered dietitian, but I know you have a lot of passion for public health and you have a master degree in public health, right? Yes. So, so yes, what basically means, because I, I um, uh, usually work one-on-one -on -one or I like to work with people. You do like to work on a big project. You like to work with the community. So, um, so I went on your website and I did say, what did it say? Being healthy should not make you miserable. And I think this is what we're going to be talking about today. So tell me, uh, what's your experience with body and mind connection? We call it psychosomatic effect. Do you have any maybe particular stories, like a real uh, clients maybe you worked with and you realize, well, no, nutrition or uh, medicine or whatever approach they're using is not going to help um, unless you unless you manage your stress uh, unless you st uh, manage your stress and unless you realize that maybe there's some trauma that comes from a childhood that comes from somewhere causing uh, this health issues. So what is your experience? I'm just curious because I can talk about it forever. Yeah, um, my first experience actually came through um, sports. So um, I have always been very, very physically active. And so, you know, I grew up in a way that we weren't given lots of like bad food, as we call it, like junk food. It was like limited to once a week. Um, but, you know, no matter how much you train or how healthily you eat, it doesn't really do anything in terms of your performance if you don't have the correct mindset. So that was the first time I learned that, like, there's a connection between your mind and your body. Because if you, no matter how hard you train, if you go into the sport, whatever sport it is, with the mindset that I'm going to fail, this person is faster than I am, or this person is better than I am, then you might as well just have eaten a hamburger or had like a Coke right before the game because your performance will be affected just as badly, if not even more than if just by your mindset. 
So that was my first experience. And then <clears throat> so that's very, you know, you know it's really interesting you, you started from that. And I know you're a big uh, soccer fan. So, so would you notice that people who, let's say, more, uh, you know, more harsh on themselves, less confident, maybe they, they physically stronger build, right? Maybe a bigger muscle or maybe, um, you know, like just a stronger build. build. But so you would notice that they are, Uh, somebody who may be uh, less, like, you know, like doesn't have an ability to eat all kinds of supplements, superfoods, right, but has a different mindset and that, that you notice that they are more likely to win. So you've seen such yes. examples? Yes. So I definitely noticed that, um, especially like you said, I watch a lot of soccer and sometimes the players that aren't necessarily the biggest, the fastest, or the strongest can sometimes be the ones who are the better players because especially it's very obvious with certain positions, but like for someone, it's very obvious for like a soccer player, even basketball, to know that if they're going through a form of bad patch, um, at that point, it's like, okay, maybe they didn't play well in one game, but if it really starts to affect them mentally, then you can see like right before they try to shoot a goal or try to pass the ball, there's this like slight hesitation. And then all of a sudden, an opponent who shouldn't be able to even be on their level because that opponent is full of confidence and is like, I'm going to be able to get that ball. I'm going to be able to outrun this person who on a normal day is a lot faster than me. You suddenly see that person is outperforming the other player who is having lots of self-doubt and lots of just questions about their talent. Even though we all know if you've seen the person, you know the person can do it. You know the person is sleeping correctly they're eating correctly they're doing everything correctly but it's all in the brain oh are you talking about me right now <laughs> no i'm not judging you, I'm not judging you <laughs> no 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 because you know it, it's true it's true yeah. because uh sometimes yes you do know how to eat properly you you do it you exercise you sleep well you cover all the basics i mean yes you do have to cover basics because some people may think well it doesn't matter you know it's only my mind connection and then sometimes very often something is still missing so this is a very good starting example of somebody who is not performing but now we are talking about health so yeah. let's say somebody who failed because of uh, lack of self-confidence. So how can it lead to uh, physical problems, physical uh, problems, like eventually? So this is just an example that we often kind of ignore in our life. Yes. I, can, I can give another simple example of, you know, like when we, let's say when we have to travel somewhere in the morning, right? And we're afraid to miss a plane. We need to want to be on time. We, we start having uh, sleeping issues. Sometimes we cannot fall asleep. Sometimes mm -hmm. we wake up, like we, we have some kind of anxiety. So it affects our sleep. Another example would be GI all the time, all yes. the time. People, let's say, who stress may become more constipated. Mm -hmm. or all of a sudden they may have diarrhea, for example, right? We all know we need to go to the exam and all of a sudden, no, we need to go all pee first. You can't, right? you can't stop going to the okay. bathroom. <laughs> so there are million simple examples like that. This is a good starting point. So now I wonder, at, so we obviously always ignore it. We don't notice it. So we have to start noticing those simple connections, which are very... Uh, innocent by themselves if it mm -hmm. happens but if you ignore it chronically and they happen they happen and especially something more serious happen and it becomes the way you treat yourself the way the way you treat others right the way you treat uh, your life so how the at which point does it become an illness can it become a disease can can it be uh, a reason why some people do get diabetes and some people mm -hmm. don't so Where so I'm going to start? start with um, you bringing up diabetes because I will never forget, um, I saw this patient, um, I was in the hospital that day and, you know, I was just told, you know, there's a young man around your age who has come in with diabetes for reference. Um, he was definitely like at least late 20s, early 30s. So I went to see him um, and he was very, very, very thin. So I was like, okay, so... He has diabetes, but like he's severely malnourished. So my thought is, okay, we need to treat that, but we also need to deal with the fact that this man is like, he looks like he's 
not eating at all. His BMI has to definitely be in the underweight category. So we start talking to him. I'm just asking him, how are you? How's your day going? And like, what brought you in? And so he says that, you know, he works a very demanding job, doesn't have a lot of time, does, um, so spends a lot of time at work. Um, he says that he just kind of like eats whatever is available on the go. Um, and that, you know, he always has been of a slim build. And then, <clears throat> sorry. So then I start questioning him more, like, what exactly are you eating? So he's like, oh, I wake up in the morning and I, you know, I have some oatmeal. And then, you know, maybe for lunch, I'll go out and I'll get something like a burger or a sandwich. And then, you know, I'm usually at work until 8 p.m. By the time I get home, it's 9. I'm not really hungry. I just kind of like drink a liter of soda and then go to bed, which firstly, I was surprised that he was able to sleep with like a liter of soda in him. And then mm -hmm. secondly, it was just like, okay, so you're not eating anything that should make you that skinny. So I'm very confused. I asked him about his working out. Maybe he's exercising too much. And he was like, no, I'm fine. The only reason I came in here was because you know, I've been feeling a bit sad and a, a little depressed, but, you know, it wasn't until my eyesight started getting very woozy that I came in because I remember my grandma always telling me that, you know, your eyesight getting woozy is a sign of diabetes. So then I was just like, okay, so my colleague was like, yeah, we think he has type 2 diabetes, but I wasn't convinced. Um, I was pretty sure it was type 1 diabetes instead of type 2 just because his lifestyle didn't necessarily match up because he did mention, I asked him about physical activity and he said, you know, he tries to um, walk around during his lunch break and he had an Apple watch. So he was averaging like 12,000 steps daily um, and he wasn't mm -hmm. trying to lose weight or anything. So finally I asked him, you know, did some, you said you were sad. Did something happen before all of these symptoms started showing up? And then he mentioned that, you know, he had lost a parent. Um, and he had been depressed for a very long time, um, which then I was like, so that's what triggered your diabetes. It would have been severe depression because he said he was really sad, but he didn't realize it was depression. He just was like sad. He didn't want to go out anywhere. He didn't really want to cook anything because it just cooking was an activity he did with that parent and yeah. just that yeah. kind of thing. So it was the depression, as you know, type one diabetes, um, I'm sure you've heard that people generally do say that it's preceded by some kind of illness before you actually get diagnosed with the type 1 diabetes. But I don't think people take mental health into account as an illness. They usually think, oh, you had the flu or maybe you got a cold. And it's no, this time it was a mental effect that a mental health issue that ended up manifesting very much in a physical way. And he ended up getting diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Yes, yes. So diabetes with type 1. So it's autoimmune disease, right? Yes. And there are many other autoimmune diseases. <laughs> and I uh, very much like how, you know, and type 1 diabetes becomes, you know, type 2 becomes older and older. And type, yes. Uh, I mean, sorry, type 2 becomes younger and younger. And type, younger. One, and type, type 1 becomes older and older, yes. right? So basically, and I really like when people with type 1 are diagnosed at like age 60, for example. When it's age mm -hmm. 4, 5, okay, right? Kind of like makes sense. We will leave them there. But when I remember uh, seeing a patient, she was diagnosed with type 1. She's 60 years old, mm -hmm. right? And the answer she got from her doctor is we don't know right like we don't know so and basically this is it like like some of this autoimmune diseases and i'm dealing with it a lot recently is they don't know where it's coming from and they they don't point at anything what i also yeah. don't what i also noticed that um so why what you know and this is the reason why i decided to meet with you and talk about it so people can start paying attention why it's always this little symptoms like i'm upset about something mm -hmm. or i'm reacting to something to you know something this way because we we kind of learn to live with that we 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 already used to seeing people looking happy looking satisfied but they may be extremely depressed and yes. then all of a sudden somebody ends up with a suicide 
for example, yeah. this is the worst scenario, or autoimmune disease, or some kind of illness, right? And this is already kind of too late to pay attention to it. So I also wanted to add, if we're talking about this, um, um, when I did my internship in a um, surgical weight loss center with bariatric patients, yeah. and I noticed that, so, I mean, obviously, one of the criteria for being uh, eligible for the surgical weight loss is, you know, is obesity, right? Is mm -hmm. uh, extra weight. Yes. So we usually think, I don't know if we're talking about diabetes, we usually think of um, of excessive weight linked mm -hmm. to diabetes, right? Yes. Or like if you're eating unhealthy, if you have extra weight, if you're not physically active, you're more likely to get diabetes. Yes. I was extremely surprised that many, 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 many of my bariatric mm -hmm. patients did not have diabetes. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Imagine, yeah, right? They don't. And another good example is um, my grandma, who had type two diabetes. I mean, she still has type two diabetes, and she was always wondering. I remember her asking. I remember talking about it, and she was always wondering, "How come I have diabetes? How come I have diabetes?" And everybody used to tell her all her life. Or you just need to eat better. Or you just need to watch what you're eating. Or you just need to avoid carbs. Or you just need to work out and exercise. And um, this was put to her head. And she, all her life, she saw that she's not doing good enough. That she's doing something wrong and it's all her fault. And the only factor, I mean, yes, food, diet is extremely, it's a big part of diabetes. Of course, yeah. we're not gonna, we're not arguing about that. But um, I remember we talking to her and she was wondering, she's like, I'm not eating that bad. Like, I'm looking at some of my girlfriends who are older than me, who eat worse, but mm -hmm. they don't have diabetes. And, but the sad part to me was that nobody ever pointed at anything else. Because if we're talking about diabetes, we only, only talking about food. And yes. diet by itself cannot help. So uh, long story short, so my grandma, who was an, on insulin um, for a really long time, and you know the story because I shared it with you, uh, mm -hmm. who was on insulin for a really long time, on, and who saw that diabetes and what's happening to her body is her only fault, and the reason for that is she's not eating right. And she didn't know how to eat yeah. right. And eventually, right now, I strongly believe that her diabetes was caused by uh, the way she reacted to a really, really extremely stressful situation in her life. There was like one particular situation where two uh, episodes happened in a row. So that uh, diet would still not be enough for her. So she was on yeah. insulin and even insulin was not enough for her until you know that we had a few years ago the moment when she had um like she passed out you know she was in a coma for a little bit and her diabetes mm -hmm. went away she's not on insulin anymore so she had another stressful situation i mean it's, i know it's a little bit confusing what i'm talking about but um she was a perfect example for me and i and i you know i have a lot of em empathy for that that uh somebody taught her made her believe that this is only food or yeah or, or somebody being told it's unknown factor why you have autoimmune disease for example and that's why i want to point that the the body and mind connection the psychosomatic effect has a huge yes. huge effect on our body do you have any other examples how you kind of seen story in the long term and yeah. it was like it was like maybe immediately obvious to you that there's something more behind it yeah, so specifically, my specialty in um, public health is maternal and child health. Um, and I really like a lot of like fertility nutrition and anything like reproductive nutrition, which is a very small, very understudied field. But you know, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with 
hormones, everything goes out of whack, essentially. Yes. All the rules get thrown out the door. So it's very easy to tell someone that has hypertension or diabetes that it's only their diet, which is why it's always so important to take a holistic approach to everything. You need to know, are there stressors in the person's life? And, you know, as you said, we live a very, like, I think the, the way the world is, we're all used to getting stressed. If we're not stressed, we're stressed about the fact that we're not stressed because we're like, what's going on? Why am I not stressed and everyone else is stressed? What's wrong with me? I know, so right? We it's create true. stress. You, for you even feel guilty when you're happy. You feel guilty. You're like, I'm having fun right now. I should be doing something with my time. I know. So we're so used to it. But, like, stress is actually not good. And having those two stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, are actually on all the time is not good. Yes, it's normal to like before presentation at work or in class or before meeting someone, I should hope that your stress levels go up a little bit. But then it shouldn't be like that the entire time because you cause problems for yourself. And you okay. see that a lot in reproductive nutrition because... For example, when your stress hormones are too high, like cortisol specifically, the signal it sends back to the brain is that we're in a fight or flight situation, shut down anything that is unnecessary to survival. Unnecessary to survival means yes. Your, yes. your digestive system will yes. get shut down. Yep. So you might have constipation, you might just suddenly not, not have an appetite. And then another thing that happens is your reproductive system is deemed unimportant uh, in this yep. situation. Yep. So it's very common that with a lot of women that, you know, you might lose your period in a time of intense stress. You might not have any issues, but in a time of intense stress that month, you might not get your period. The so month, you might not get your period. So thank you so much. So you were talking about fertility, which mm -hmm. is a big deal. And then I, I just want to add. So then we can say about menopause because many yes. women ask you, like, how can I prevent? How can yes. I prevent? Well, you cannot prevent it. Like when you're 45, you know, and you're about to be on menopause. So, okay. So that's a, two really common big deal yes. issues. Okay. I get that a lot um, because I'm in that field. I've seen a lot of men women who are um, in menopause who want to lose weight and are very frustrated that they're not losing the weight. And I have to tell them, your body right now, the hormones are making it such that you will retain water and you will retain gas. And it, do not look at the scale. Just keep doing yep. the healthy stuff you need yes. to do. And eventually, when you are no longer under the menopausal issue, it's going to, you know, your weight will actually show a reflection. But it's very hard sometimes because then you become stressed about not losing the weight. And then, so therefore it's like this cycle that doesn't end because now you're stressed and sometimes stress can actually make weight loss even harder. And of course. Yep. So it's yep. just like this vicious cycle. And then you and, add you know, another, then you add another stress because somebody, you know, somebody told you some influencer told you, you yes. should lose 20 pounds a week and yep. you're working hard eating that salary. You're, you're eating losing. only celery, you're, yeah. you're working out 50 hours a day, and, you know, you hopped on the scale and you added a kilo or, or two yep. pounds, and you're yep. freaking out. Yep, and, and like, then you're adding more them, stress. Mm -hmm. You're adding more stress, and I have to tell them, like, your mind and your body are connected. So what you put in your mind comes out in your body. So talking that you started, and I kind of, like, I interrupted you, I know, a little bit. So you started with fertility. So did yes. you have any particular maybe women uh, who had struggle with getting pregnant because of that and maybe yes. they fix it somehow and manage and then they ha had a success? Yeah. Did you, did you, have you seen those stories? Okay, yeah, so, uh, so that's a very common one um, in fertility nutrition is you generally have um, the woman and sometimes her husband who come in and the woman is beyond stressed she thinks that there's something wrong with her system like what is she doing wrongly she stopped smoking if which is common she stopped smoking she stopped drinking she's eating all of these you know healthy exotic foods um to increase her fertility and she's you yep. know she's sleeping while she's even wearing like making sure her temperature is right she's checking she's mm -hmm. ovulating mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sometimes i'm just like okay wow that's a lot i'm stressed listening to you i know right mm -hmm. like i am stressed listening to you so mm -hmm. and i'm like you know sometimes you have to ask like 
okay, you're trying to get pregnant. Are you even enjoying the process of getting pregnant? Because that's one way that stress can manifest itself. Because if in trying to get pregnant, you're just thinking, I'm ovulating now. Come on, let's go. It's not fun. So and oftentimes when we talk to them, like I, I talk to them and um, I saw this also with my preceptor, you know, it's you have to talk them down like it's OK. You give statistics. You're not the first one. It's a stressful thing. And guess what? Stress actually makes it harder. And you explain the whole link between like if you're too stressed, your body's going to shut down your reproductive system. Go on a holiday. Forget about it. Maybe start drinking wine or eating something that you like and usually like the minute they're like okay maybe i i can't have a baby or maybe i'll just wait maybe it's not now you know maybe it's you know the universe is telling me a different sign usually it's like oh my gosh i'm pregnant <laughs> and it's like well, you stop stressing about it i know right you stop stressing about it yeah that's uh that's a really excellent example and i kind of want to continue that topic with uh uh, you know, hormone disbalance and menopause and uh, yeah. uh, thyroid issue, which are very big deal common, you know, in, on top of weight and they, on top mm -hmm. of hypertension. It's a very common issue that women ask all the time and kind of want to prevent it, kind of want to deal with that. And the COS is another one as well that causes. So you have a lot of knowledge about PCOS. What can you say? What psychosomatic, what thoughts, what behavior, what kind of relationship with yourself can lead to that? Can you give maybe an example or something maybe you noticed? Yeah. Like so, hypothetically, maybe at least. Yeah. Um, disclaimer, I have PCOS, but what I have noticed is um, I there's the stereotype of PCOS causes a lot of anxiety already in women who have it. So there's mm -hmm. this anxiety of, I'm not going to be able to have children, which is generally like the first one, which it's not true. You, you can have children with PCOS. Then yeah. the next one becomes, you know, you're, when you go to the doctor and you finally get diagnosed with PCOS, the first thing they will usually do is like, you can have children, but then if you're big, then they will tell you, you know, you need to be careful because you're going to get diabetes, you're going to get hypertension and you need to lose weight. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, with PCOS, you mentioned hormone imbalance. Your hormones are out of balance. So then what happens is a lot of the times PCOS, a lot of PCOS people start developing a lot of anxiety surrounding food. So now eating becomes something that's like very much a problem. And it usually ends up in orthorexia where like they only want to eat clean and then they work out crazy hours um, then you also have those who end up developing binging, um, anorexia becomes yes. very common, bulimia, especially because every time you go to the doctor to complain, um, you know, about the whole fat stereotyping and fat weight stigma in medicine, every time they go, a lot of their stuff is always dismissed as lose weight, lose weight, you're going to get hypertension. And it's like, that's not helping because a yes. lot of the... A, a lot of the women I've spoken to with PCOS, their main preoccupation isn't even so much diabetes or hypertension. Mm -hmm. It's always losing weight and why they're not losing weight the way they would mm -hmm. like to. Yeah. And I saw that a lot in the US where it's like, mm -hmm. we would see patients where like their main thing was, I want to lose X amount of weight. And they would, you know, mention a crazy diet that told them they would lose X amount, like 20 pounds in one month. And they're yeah. stressed. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you so much. You know, that brings another extremely important point is I actually seen a woman crying um, who had a, she, she had a gestational diabetes mm -hmm. and she was crying because to her, it means she's a bad mom, that she's hurting her baby and she's extremely stressed. And the reason she was crying is uh, a dietitian told her, uh, we're not going to manage it just by diet. You need to start, um, you know, some kind of treatment like insulin, or, you know, because it was not her first pregnancy and she was pre-diabetic before and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the good point about it is very often when we go to see a professional, 
Yeah. And professionals very often, you know, let's say I'm, you know, let's say I'm a nutritionist, right? So I only know, I, I, I try to, you know, I try to work on my communication skills, but not mm -hmm. all health professionals are excellent at communicating. Yeah. They may be the smartest doctors, they may be the smartest professionals, but they don't always know how to word it. I'm looking at my father, for example, sometimes. He can be very harsh with diagnosis <laughs> or with the way he says things. He's very smart, he's very educated. Uh, and a dangerous part about it, and I, I always bring it to people, people who are about to be diagnosed, who, who were just diagnosed, because I've seen real cases where the person will get diagnosed with a disease, mm -hmm. and especially somebody who is not medical professional, and they don't know about, much about it. It sounds scary. Yes. And the thought about it may destroy them faster than the disease itself. Exactly. It happens a lot with cancer patients mm -hmm. and their relatives because not all cancer cases are, you know, life saddening. You know, it's not, not all cases mean you're going to, you know, you're going to be on a chemotherapy. Some treatable, some, you know, so, you know, there's many, uh, you know, it's not like, it's not always as scary, but they call they call it cancer or like some other diseases right yeah and they thought about it starts destroying them they become so stressed so it does happen a lot with um uh mistakes that happen when somebody let's say suspect that you may have cancer for example or you may yeah. have that or that may happen or with an example that you just told me right when somebody was diagnosed with PCOS, they start thinking, oh, I'm not going to have babies, or I'm not going to, yeah. or I'm definitely going to have this and this and this problem. And they actually, eventually, because they're thinking so much about it, yep. it's, they, it adds so much stress in their body. I don't know how exactly it works. Maybe it causes some kind of imbalance. Maybe there's so much stress, so much tension that eventually they become physically ill. Or if yes. they're talking about diagnosis, they, I, I often, like, I often uh, think, like, here's a person who just found out he, like, he or she has this diagnosis, and the person got so stressed to the point that they think their life is ending, nothing mm -hmm. is not going to get better, and I feel like they would live longer and happier if they didn't yes. go to the doctor and if they didn't know about it. Yes. But now, now they know they start destroying themselves. And if people around them not don't understand them, like, like some people start freaking out or like relatives start feeling bad for you. You so the rest of your days you basically live in stress like you're about to die yeah. any day. And this just definitely destroys your body yes. a lot. And I think it's very important, um, you know we're both dietitians, so you know we have to learn how to talk to people and food is very much psychological and part of that is you know when you see someone who wants to lose weight or something you generally have to bring ask them about their family environment because for some people they come in they want to lose the weight they want to do this they're super motivated so it's not like some of these other people that you know they were forced to come see the dietitian and they were told they have to lose weight these people are interested but then if you have someone at home who's always talking negatively to you oh there's no point in losing weight and then you know when you're trying to maybe eat a healthy meal they're like oh i'm not buying your healthy meal i'm i'm just gonna give you this unhealthy meal um it just derails you because it's you know the, that saying mind over matter is not it really means a lot your mind plays a huge role in it we see it all the time in scientific studies where the placebo effect, just the mere thought that you might be getting a treatment for something, some people do get better from whatever was ailing them. And it's, that's the placebo effect. And there's some people that, you know, it's been proven that excess stress does depress your immune system. So when you're super stressed, your immune system just kind of goes down and you're now open for all sorts of opportunistic infections. That's why maybe when you're stressed, you might get a cold, even though, you know, you haven't been around someone who maybe to your knowledge has a cold. And that's something that's very important, like in PCOS, in 
trying to, in reproductive nutrition, like just trying to get pregnant, what that kind of negative self talk, like your first thought when you got PCOS is, I'm going to get diabetes and die or something, especially if diabetes runs in your family, or I'm never going to have children. And that just eats away at the mindset of some people where it's just like, they go into this depression and it's just now it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy where they don't try anything. They're just depressed. And then eventually it degrades into maybe you end up developing diabetes or hypertension. And you're like, well, I knew it was going to happen anyway. And it's like, I wonder if you hadn't gone and gotten this diagnosis, what would it have ended up this way? Um, I totally agree with you. There are a million of other examples, and I see it all the time that they could, you know, um, give you right now. And I, I feel like maybe we can, now as I'm talking to you, I feel like, well, knowing that, we can actually look at it from a different perspective. Okay, mm -hmm. we know it may affect we know that uh, our stress, some childhood trauma, so some, mm -hmm. uh, even something um, that happened in the past and you kind of let it be, let it stay with you and, and maybe you overreacted to something. So it may affect, it may, it may not necessarily, the cause may not necessarily be what's happening right now. It may yeah. be what happened to you in a year ago, five years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So, I feel like the good news is knowing this information, mm -hmm. we can twist it and look at it from a different side. Yes. If we know that stress can lead to physical illnesses, that we can basically try to focus a lot on our uh, relationship with ourselves, self-love, mm -hmm. relationship, how other people treat us, yes. uh, maybe remembering what is hurting us, what maybe some kind of trauma that still mm -hmm. are with us, work on them. And that may actually can help you to be healthy. So kind of yes. like going from another perspective, not to wait until something happens to you when you start having a physical problems to dig into, okay, what caused it? But maybe to use this knowledge to treat yourself Try to relax as much as you can. Don't forget about your vacation to prevent it, to stay healthy, to help your body. Um, I often tell my people, like, who I work with, I, very often, like, you know, like, you, you meet somebody and they're like, okay, we're working with you and now I, I want to lose weight. I want to do that and I want to do that. I always tell people who I work with in advance right now. I always tell hey, I know you want to lose 20 pounds, for example, but we're not only going to be losing 20 pounds. I'm going to check that, that, and that before we get there. Because, yeah. I mean, like, you know, we check GI and some other things, but one of the factors I looked at is stress. So when mm -hmm. I'm working with somebody and somebody is extremely stressed, I'm not going to push them to work harder because there's no way. So um, I feel like it's fair... Um, to use this knowledge as a prevention plan yes as, okay so how how do you take care of it how do you pay attention what can you do like how can you help yourself how do you let's say for example i'm feeling stressed right like for example i'm feeling stressed right now and sometimes it's not enough to say well you should not feel stressed right yeah, that's the uh, most what, helpful thing to say. <laughs> right? Well, like, calm down, right? Don't feel when, stressed, and it goes away. I know, I know, right? When, when, a, when a man and woman are fighting, the worst thing a guy can say is, like, calm down, right? <laughs> Always like, works. Oh, no, now I'm, now I'm less calm than before. Now oh, he's like, yeah, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. I need yeah. to calm down, done. So what can you do? Like, I'm feeling stressed. We very often, you, like, for example, you understand it's not a big deal. You understand it's not mm -hmm. life threatening, but you, you don't know what to do. So what yeah. can you do in such cases? Do you have any advices? Yes. So the first thing I generally advise people to do, whether a client, like some, the first thing I always ask my client is like, how are you today? And how was your week? And, you know, sometimes people will be like, yeah, it was fine. But like, you kind of like can tell from the voice. It's like, mm, that, that wasn't a very like good or convincing fine. Like what's going on? And I think that's the first thing, even as an individual, even if you don't have a dietitian or if you, you have a doctor that doesn't ask that kind of question about you personally, always try to recognize your feelings. Always kind of do a check-in with yourself. Like, 
okay, how am I feeling right now at this moment or as I woke up? Am I kind of feeling, eh? Is there a reason why I'm feeling, eh? Is there like an identifier? Is there a trigger? Is it that I didn't sleep well? Is it that I'm hungry? Sometimes, you know, you can wake up really hungry and it just like ruins your day. What is it? Am I like in pain or did was there a situation that I personally went like, oh, it's not that big a deal, but clearly it was a big enough deal to actually yeah. bother me. Yes. So, you know, I always yes. tell my patients and I tell myself like, yes, to maybe to me, I'm sitting down and trying to dismiss my own issue as it's not that serious. It's not that serious. But then it's like five hours later, I'm still sitting here. I haven't eaten anything and I'm bothered. So clearly it was serious. So first yes. thing you need to like, what about it? made it annoying to you and even if you have to talk to yourself i love talking to myself Why talk not? to yourself and be like this is what about the situation annoyed me maybe i wish i had said this instead of that what can i change moving forward because you know having an action plan helps and then afterward always notice your trigger like when you're stressed are you extra hungry are you not hungry if it's a situation where you don't eat when you're stressed kind of you should realize that to make sure that you're not going too long without eating because you don't want that situation where in case you are exposed to a lot of stress all of a sudden a month goes by and you're like hmm i didn't really eat much this month or i didn't okay. really sleep much so here uh as a starter there are two things you can start to well first of all you always check on your basal needs always food sleep are you happy because there's no way you're going to convince yourself calm down and relax and meditate and you know take a shower yeah. if if basal needs are not met right so you check on that so okay and second you always you never ignore the way you feel because mm -hmm. uh let's say your girlfriend says well it's not a big deal why are you even stressed and you think well maybe you know i'm overreacting but yeah. maybe it is big deal to you the way you see this work the way yes. you approach it right and so okay mm -hmm. we need to make sure that you know, we casually dismiss these, these things, but like everyone's feelings are valid. You don't have to agree with how yes. someone maybe express yes. their feelings, but like, yes. you don't even have to understand yes. what might not be a big deal to someone else is a big deal to you. But yes, you know, don't dismiss that feeling because your girlfriend said it's yes. not a big deal. Your boyfriend yes. said that just yes. acknowledge yes. that. Okay, it's not yes. a big deal, but it, it's a big deal to me. Why and, is it a big deal? And we even do it on? to ourselves. We yes, we say, do it to ourselves a lot. It's like, well, what's a big deal? Why is this? But it is maybe a big deal for some reason. So you have to respect that. Because mm -hmm. this is a, like, we all do that. I, I do it all the time. I do I it like, all the time. Where I'm like, I was like, too sensitive. Yeah. And then it's like, okay. Also, watch how you talk to yourself. That's, I, you mentioned something about self-love. And I think... If you wouldn't say that to your best friend or your parents or your sibling, don't say it to yourself. Because I find that as human beings, we are much harsher to ourselves. So, you know, if you wouldn't call your sister stupid for having these, if you wouldn't verbally say to her, you might think it. But if you wouldn't verbally say to her, I don't know why you're, you're stressed about it. It's not a big deal. That's stupid. Don't say that to yourself. Because yes. then you're just compounding the feeling of stress. Yes. Because yes. now you're calling yourself stupid on top of already being stressed. Yes. Yes. So those are really excellent examples. Okay. Okay. So you meet your basal needs. You're making sure, you know, you're eating. I mean, and if there is a real reason that you're aware of, mm -hmm. you, you need to solve it. You need to figure yes. out how to solve it. Um, that should, you know, you need to address it first. You cannot, yes. it would not be normal not to feel stressed when you have no place to live and no yes. food to eat tomorrow. Exactly. So, so you have to, okay. So what else would you bring? What, what else would you? Um, um, find add? a way to constructively solve the issue, what's stressing you. So okay. for some people, it's not possible to maybe confront the situation. If you're not, a, if you don't want an argument, sometimes just find a journal maybe write it out um for some people you might may maybe want to try meditation relaxation techniques there's a lot there are a lot of apps now out there that help like with breathing techniques like if you're getting very anxious and you're just kind of working yourself up just breathe in breathe out 
maybe write a letter to the an imaginary letter to the person um if it's your boss don't send it because you don't potentially want to be out of a job but you know unless you want to be out of a job I like to want to be out of the job and send a letter by all. But things. because that may help a lot with the stress. That management. might help a lot. Um, <laughs> find good people around you. Um, toxic relationships can, you know, sometimes you can be so used to toxic relationships, you don't realize they're a stressor. But find someone that you can talk to that won't tell you, oh, you're being silly. Oh, you know, it's ridiculous. Yes. Find yes. someone who will listen to you and say, yeah, I can see from your understanding why that's annoying. Yeah, I can see that. And find someone to bounce ideas off of like, okay, so yeah, I can see why that's annoying. You know what? Let's go do this instead. Find so if find someone to talk to, that can also unburden you. Um find a hobby you like so when if you can't think it out, do something you like. Excellent. Okay, so Basil needs uh acknowledge your feelings uh address them don't ignore if they're real problems yeah. and I, i i actually think that uh sort of course is actually very excellent so make look who surrounds you hear mm -hmm. what other people say and people who are negative to you who are unfair to you you like toxic people you know yeah. it can be it can be even people who you love or it yes. can be can be your relatives it can mm -hmm. be your husband it can be your friend it can be a boss it can be anybody who you cannot avoid for some reason let's say you live with someone or you at work so yes yes avoid them uh like at least or maybe decrease the amount of time you spend mm -hmm. with them if it's impossible and and be surround yourself with the friends who you're comfortable with yes because if you constantly hurt if you're very stressed it's very 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 easy to stop believing in people and mm -hmm. end up being alone mostly yes and that i think that may be a little bit being alone for a little bit it's good it's healthy it's normal but being always alone at yeah. may you may not you may get used to it and you it's harder to get out so be around the people but choose who you are with very wise Yeah, so okay, very good, very good. Do you have anything else to add to um like like on to that part of prevention? Like how can we do how we yeah, can we um, address it? I do think that sometimes we we like to indulge in things that might not necessarily be good for us. So, you know, if in saying that do something that you like, if you're not feeling good, don't drink alcohol because generally what will happen is you're like oh i'll just have a glass of wine and sometimes you might end up overindulging and that can sometimes like a lot a lot of times mental stressors sometimes stress can lead to what we do see as functional alcoholics where they they get through their day fine but they have an issue with alcohol or you start mm. medicating with like mm. i don't know um ibuprofen or Mm -hmm. any other kind of substance so you know find something that involves maybe yeah, go out yeah. and get some fresh air if you're feeling very like energetic angry you know kickbox or something but it's better to be around find a way to vent it in a healthy way because mm -hmm. we also don't want a situation where you know sometimes there are people who get so stressed or angry that you know they punch walls or something like that don't do that so find a way to express your frustration in a healthy way um yes i i would say i'm definitely agree with not switching to something that is harmful to another thing that is harmful and yeah. alcohol is an example or overeating is an example yes. um i don't know like maybe smoking or yes drugs I mean We see it all the time with bariatric mm -hmm. patients where a lot of the time something was stressing them. I don't know what, but like their comfort was in food. And it's like, you shouldn't use something like food or alcohol or, or as you said, smoking as a crutch. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a, a healthy outlet. So mm -hmm. don't internalize it. If you have to express it again, look at your environment you might be surrounded by your main stressor 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and it's very, very dangerous to start a bad habit when yes. you are stressed because 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 you need a solution. It's it's understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, understandable. Just, it's very understandable. But um, this is one of the rules I kind of somehow taught myself. Uh, I I always told myself um, not to enjoy uh, an alcoholic drink, a cocktail, a glass of wine mm -hmm. when I'm stressed. Uh, I can have it for pleasure, but yes. you know because now it's very popularized. Like if your girlfriend having a bad day, grab a bottle of wine and come. Your kids are annoying. You yeah. have some wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying not to do that because it's very yes. easy to follow because it will yes. work actually, right? It will yeah, work. It will. You, you and it's it's uh, it gets it may you may become addicted to it and then yes. you didn't solve the initial trigger mm -hmm. and now you have another one so you may yes. end up. Uh, you, it's it's gonna be you may it's gonna be really hard to figure out when you're gonna when the problem is gonna build up. Excellent, exactly. excellent. We do have a few minutes only yes. um, to discuss. Is there anything maybe you wanted to add? Maybe a book you would recommend to read, or yes. maybe um, like many maybe other sources of information, like what. Oh, what can we do about like wh where else can we read about psychosomatic? I know it's becoming more and more popular, and I'm I'm really happy about it. And I'm reading about it a lot. I have a few books I um I I would uh, I will mention. Do you have anything maybe? Yes. Yeah, so you know about? I have this, this book that um, men should also read it, even if the title doesn't apply to you. Um, it's called the Menopause Diet. And why I recommend <laughs> I, 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 you know, I doubt any man will buy it. <laughs> well, the reason why I say it is because I read it and I'm not menopausal yet, but it's because it stress is, as we already discussed, such a big factor in menopause that there's a good amount. It's by a fertility dietitian. And there is like at least like two chapters that are solely dedicated to just talking about working through stress. So it's, uh, what's the name of the book? Because I may add it to The Menopause Diet by Hillary Wright. Okay. So Wright with W-R-I-G-H-T. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Okay. So it's not about menopause. It's about... No, uh, it's, um, it, it, it's a bit of a misnomer to me um, because basically she kept getting questions from a lot of menopausal women like, you know, my emotions are out of control right now. Like I just get mad at everything and I just want to know how to control it. Um, is there something I can eat to improve my mood? Is there something I can eat to lose weight? And a so, lot of it talks about hormones and stress and how to manage so, that. Uh, by the name of the book, so it will give some practical recommendations of yes. what foods to eat and not to eat. Do you agree with those recommendations? Because I, I haven't uh, read this book. Yes, I agree with the recommendations. I okay. there are lots of very like eat a lot of fresh foods that will help you know with just improving your mood as well. So okay, I agree with okay, like exercise and stuff like that. And, okay, so it has some stuff. practical meditation, uh, yoga. Yeah, got you, got you. Okay, uh, any any other book, any other literature, yes, podcast? There is one that um, sorry, I have to look it up because oh, I forgot okay. the title. But it has a very colorful cover. That's what mm -hmm. I was saying. Um, you can go ahead and recommend some of your books. Well, I have. Um, well, I have one book that I mentioned you earlier. Um, well, the other books that I know about, they are in Russian, so I'm not gonna recommend <laughs> them. But they are excellent, actually. The one I have. Is very depressing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> my, my marketing skills are, you know, very good. It's a very depressing book, and I, I, I didn't manage to read through that, as I told you. It's, but yeah. I think this is the only popular book in the market that at least addresses this problem, what we've been talking about. It's uh, The Body Keeps the Score. It is talking well, about yeah, yeah, yeah. brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma. It's how... And um, as you know, I did uh, my internship in veterans home and I did mm -hmm, see many, yeah. obviously, veterans who have um, 
uh, who who PTSD now is, they, yeah. they basically deal with a stressful situation, and yeah. now they all dealing with physical problems as well. And how yeah. it, especially for them, how it has to be addressed, like must mm-hmm. be addressed, because that's very obvious. And I think yeah. they're. Um, I think actually the research, the, some of the research that mentioned in this book were done here in Massachusetts yeah. uh, and they did work with veterans. So they do have some valuable information. Only for that reason, I would probably uh, read a few chapters. Yeah, another not... book, another book, sorry, I have, it's not, it's not a book. I found it an audible. It's very simple, maybe two hour listening, but very, very simple solution. And I actually use it myself. It's called okay. the three day effect. Uh, it basically tells uh, how nature can help you to uh, calm your brain. Oh, okay. So, and I do very often feel how it works in me. But let's say you're in a stressful situation, mm-hmm. being at the beach, being in the <laughs> mountains, moving, walking, yeah. being in the nature, because the colors, the nature, it calms really you down. Uh, yeah. There are many other books. Did, did you find the one you wanted yeah, to Yeah, so it's The Mind Body Stress Reset. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. By Rebecca Ladine. Ladine, I don't really know how to say it. <laughs> um, okay. But basically, she's recommending, um, basically, the full title is <clears throat> The Mind Body Stress Research somatic practices to reduce stress so yes. basically she goes through um she taught like it's not as educational or let me not say educational it's not as um jargony as it sounds so anyone can pick this book up and read it and understand it it's not just for like professionals but she basically breaks it down how stress has an effect not only on you know your mental health but your physical health and then she goes through the different ways that, you know, the different techniques that can help you. And it's not just one size fits all. She talks about yoga, the different relaxation techniques, meditation. Um, she talks about like, I think um, basically she talks about these different heal- alternative healing practices like yes. acupuncture, crystals and stuff like that. And it's very useful <laughs> because, you know, there's something in there for everyone as long as you approach it with the mindset of, you know, I cannot deal with all of this in my mind anymore and you know yes yes okay okay so uh we have to um we have to end i think uh we did bring so many um uh, uh great points i would just think like i just wanted to add and um um it's extremely important to find triggers. It's extremely important to find what's causing. In, because many people with diet, with stress management, we try to work on a symptom. Mm-hmm. We try to do medication when we're stressed without knowing what's causing it. Yes. We try to lose weight without understanding what else, what exactly, why mm-hmm. can't I lose weight? And the scene, the Western medicine approach does, you know, this is how it works. We do treat symptoms without understanding. Yeah. So it was a body and mind connection. It's not enough to go for a walk. It's not enough to just exercise. It's not enough to take a bubble bath or whatever you're doing. You have to do that. And at the same time, figure out, keep working on understanding yourself and what triggers it and stop ignoring it. Um, thank you, Yamidi. I think, I hope, um, I hope this video will be helpful to some and um, to, to understand themselves and to be a little bit less harsh on themselves and understand that it's way more behind diagnosis, behind symptoms, behind, um, you know, as people say, you're just lazy, you're not working hard enough. Yeah. It's not that simple. And stress in your thoughts and your relationship with yourself is a huge part of it. Um, it has thank to be addressed. For, thank you for having, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a very important talk because, you know, every day, everywhere around us, we're told to basically be stressed. So as you said, we told to work harder every day. We've been told to work harder. Like if you're not stressed enough, it's probably because you're not working hard enough. You're lazy. 
Um, and as I said, we stress ourselves wondering why we're not stressed or why we're, we supposedly don't care. Um, and I would say, like, just as you said, figure out what triggers you. You need to find out your trigger for stress, but also when you realize that you're stressed and it doesn't have to be anything major, it could be just something very small, like mm -hmm. the traffic every day that is stressing you. Yep. So like, yep. it doesn't have to be something big. Yep. And you have to fix it. You have to, you fix, have it. to fix it. You stop telling yourself, just deal with that. Just find your peace. No. Yeah. You have hit, to fix you it. Ha you hit your job, you leave it. You, yeah. You get a motorbike you... and then ride that into town and that way you don't have to stay in traffic. Um, but yep. fix, find the stressor, fix it, and also note your reaction to the stressor. Was your reaction to, I don't know, become more controlling in other areas of your life, controlling what you eat? Because um, that sometimes can be an effect where an eating disorder can happen because suddenly that's all you can control. We can always control food. So find what is your stressor? Is it to start yelling at your kids, yelling at your significant others? So find the trigger and find how you respond to it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yami. Yeah, so I will see you Thank soon. You. And, um, send me, text me the names of those books with, okay. um, uh, with the names so I can add it to the description. So maybe if somebody is interested to learn more about it, they can find it. Uh, is it All right. right? Sounds good. Uh, have a good evening, girl. Thank you. Take Thank care you. of yourself. Bye. Thank you. Bye.